Hello everyone, we're in the book of Acts this morning, chapter 1. The book of Acts, as it's commonly known for almost two millennia, was penned by the beloved physician Luke, who was a disciple of Christ and a close companion of Paul. Between Paul's other letters in the New Testament and the early church writings from prominent leaders, we know that Luke was a Gentile from Antioch and a well-known for being a very powerful evangelist. The writings within Acts have always been considered highly sophisticated and a masterful piece of work of literary work. The fact that all these letters of antiquity in the New Testament have such cohesiveness, such boldness of statement, such profoundness of thought and spirit, and such impact in nature is unique to Christianity and only Christianity. There's nothing like the New Testament in all of history, and there is nothing like Luke's recording of Acts. Luke is the only one and only Gentile to have his name attached to a book or a letter of the New Testament. And it's the only book to lay out in detailed account, in chronological order, God moving through his church post-resurrection and ascension of Jesus. The name of the book alone is tremendously powerful. The name Acts of the Apostles, it first shows up in the late second century, a mere roughly 80 years after the letter originated. Irenaeus, Bishop of Lyon, mentioned the book title as Proxus Apostolos in the Greek. That's Acts of the Apostles. And Proxus meaning a carried out action in deed. The action focuses primarily and completely on the heart. The process of how the action is carried out, the mechanism of how it's accomplished, is completely useless and empty without the heart. That's why Cain's sacrifice was rejected and Abel's was accepted. It was a matter of the heart. It's why James says, show me your faith apart from your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. A matter of the heart. So these actions we are going to read about and be challenged by and grow from over the next several weeks, these actions are heart actions. They are infused with this wonderful, Holy Spirit-type magnificence where actions and the heart and God all move together. So the Acts of the Apostles could easily be called the heart of the Apostles. Or God moving within the Apostles. Or God continuing to act in the world for the purposes, His own purposes, through the Apostles. So let's read it now, Acts chapter 1, verses 3 to 11. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times of the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes. And said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So we begin in verse 3. Right where everything begins. Where everything always begins. At the power source. With Jesus Christ as Lord. Verse 3. He presented himself. And we can get nice and cozy into those three words alone. We can grab blankets, grab some hot chocolate, or some chamomile tea, whatever you like to drink. Because get used to hearing those three words. He presented himself. We only need those three words to strengthen this room, to encourage this room, to electrify this room. You need healing. You need light in a dark world. You need peace amongst war. You need calm within a storm. You need love and all you see is hate. 
You need relief from your enemies, from the hurt that they bring, from things that cause pain. I have good news for you. Jesus presented himself. He presented himself to the Jewish leaders and the magistrates. He presented himself to the mockers from his cross. He presented himself to the apostles. He presented himself to the Father once again to his right side as he sat down on his throne. And he will come again to present himself to this world at the end of days. Do you believe that? Amen. That's a lot of amens. That's wonderful. <laughs> we praise Jesus as king that before the end, he's given us a beginning, right? He died so that we could live. Our beginning of life in the spirit started with Jesus. We all have that in common. We all have the same father. We are our all bound to the same covenant of love. We are all saved by the same blood of the Son. And we all move within the same holiness of the one and only Holy Spirit. And it all begins with Jesus. So let's add the next word in the verse. So instead of verse by verse preaching, I'll do word by word preaching. <laughs> this next word is a vital one. It's vital. It's crucial. Jesus presented himself Alive. If the book of Acts was a door that God hung in front of us as his word to teach us, to mold us, to refine us, Christ presenting himself alive is one of the hinges by which that door is able to swing. Jesus used profoundly astonishing miracles to prevent the raw power of the Lord. When he walked on water, those in the boat, those in the boat looked on it with astonishment. The resurrection of Jesus amplified the display of the pure awesomeness of God in might and in power and in glory to no end. He presented himself alive. Being alive means to have life. Pretty simple, right? And to have life means to be purposeful. There's no other area outside of Christianity where it's acceptable to have no purpose. So it's definitely not acceptable in Christianity. If you work a job, you have a purpose. That means you were assigned tasks to carry out, right? If you don't do the tasks you were hired to do, you have abandoned your purpose. And we don't show up to work pretending like we are working with a purpose, right? That wouldn't last long before you got fired. So when I was younger, in my first few jobs, I was a pro at this, to look, make myself look incredibly busy. And you want to know the secret? Here's the secret. You grab a clipboard, and you walk around like you're absolutely on a mission. Walk around like this, look at things, got to look at things. You go, oh my goodness, whoever extended this roof, my goodness, that looks wonderful. Yep, roof's looking good. Let's count the lights. Maybe I should count all these lights. Oh wow, yeah, they definitely need to be counted. Oh, gotta write that down. Drop my, drop my crayon here. Yep, lights all looking good. Oh yeah, everyone, all these chairs. Yep, investigate the chairs. Oh man, they're looking good too. Inspection almost complete, guys. I'll be out of here. I'll be in your hair in just a moment. There we go. That's what I drew you. Right there, happy face. That's what I was doing in that time. Did I look busy? I sure did look busy. Don't ask me why I have crayons. <laughs> Presenting yourself as if you are busy does not make you purposeful. If the target of purpose are specific tasks and you don't do those tasks, you miss the target completely. Jesus presented himself a lie. Jesus does not miss targets. Jesus meets all his goals and all his deadlines. Imagine being at a business meeting with Jesus. He's sitting around a boardroom table, and the CEO of the company asks Jesus, Hey Jesus, did you meet all your tasks that you were assigned to do? Hope you didn't slack off. Hope you didn't sleep in. Hope you didn't get distracted by worldly things. Hope you had, didn't have too many obstacles to overcome. Well, let's see. Relentlessly stalked by religious leaders and berated and abused for the task he was assigned to do. 
rejected by his hometown and his home family for the task he was assigned to do. Mocked, flogged, spit on, beaten, nailed to a cross for the task he was assigned to do. You play a significant role in the company's overall success, Jesus. We value you as an employee. So I'll ask you again, did you accomplish all the tasks you were assigned to do? Suffering death on a cross that he did not deserve, that he entered into willingly for us, for people that hate him, paying the penalty of sin and death for us, that we rightfully was owed to us, taking sin onto himself as God pours out his wrath onto him so that it wouldn't be poured onto us. Check. Resurrected from the dead, presenting himself alive in glory and power and majesty and supremacy and sovereignty and dominion. Check. Yes, he completed all of the tasks the Father gave him. Perfectly. God works all things according to the power and the purpose of his own will. Ephesians chapter 1. Jesus as God carried out the purposes of the miracles, the purposes of the sacrifice, the purposes of the burial, the purposes of the resurrection, the purposes of presenting himself in glory alive. He did this as God because it had to be done perfectly. And only God can act in perfection. I argue that even God is above perfection, something we can't even begin to grasp. So if the business meeting was goal, save the world, task, pay the debt of sin, there's only one person sitting at that boardroom table at that meeting that can accomplish that goal and is qualified. And do you know who that is? It's Jesus. Jesus would be an interesting guy to have at work, wouldn't he? Yeah. Hey guys, I have completed the task for everyone that has ever worked here, everyone that does work here, and everyone who will ever work here. All of the tasks. I did it in three days, and I don't even work here. <laughs> you are the best employee of all time. So put away your charts and graphs. You're not going to need them because Jesus presented himself alive. And what did he say to Martha? He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever would believe in me, though he die, will live. Jesus also spoke these words in John chapter 14. Because I live, you also will live. And if you're new to Christianity, the transfer from death to life, you now live, is in Jesus. As you're made alive as one of his children, bound to him and made right with the Father in heaven. You're now living as a living member of his body, the church, with all the rest of us. What is church membership? Membership? To be a living member of Christ on earth, held together by the Spirit of God as an ambassador of Christ, to bring the message of Christ and spread the knowledge of Him by way of deed and action with the love of God in our hearts. And that is the type of membership that is purposeful. And those purposes are alive. As Christians, we show up for duty alive. Christ is not looking for the dead to serve in duty. It's not a difficult requirement either, really, if you think about it. Imagine you go on to the job, job Bank of Canada and you look at the description. Requirements of the job must be alive. <laughs> Whoa, I think I got this. I think I got this. Do you have a pulse? You are hired. You walk into the interview. All right. Let me see here. This is the interview. Yeah, he's breathing. Hire him. Good to go. We don't even have to work to get the requirement. How do we obtain the requirement of spiritual life? Through Jesus. By our faith. We didn't have to do anything. You're all more than flesh and bone. So much more if you sit here with the life of God inside of you. You're not just a number in a company. You're not invisible. 
and your value, it can't even be measured. I want to see you become spiritual powerhouses in Jesus, and for Jesus, most importantly. This letter would look a whole lot different if Jesus was presented to the apostles as if dead. Our stories would all look different if that were the case. But no, Jesus is alive, and he presented himself alive. His purposes are divine purposes and alive. His purposes are self-glorifying purposes and alive. His purposes are earth-changing purposes and alive. His, pur his purposes are filled through him and by him and in him. Isaiah chapter 55, So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. God creates life and through Jesus creates life within that which has become dead. So come alive and burn with the fire of God within you and spread that fire around as God's messengers. Why? Because we're God's messengers. That's why we spend time fasting and praying and studying and reading God's word and worshiping and serving and obeying God so that we can prepare our spirits to become as combustible as possible, like dry pieces of kindling, so that the mere breath towards us from God and we go up in flames and we burn bright hot. We should be all walking around. It'll come up in a second. We should be all walking around with one of these on. Warning, highly combustible in the spirit. <laughs> if you tell us about a bad day or your poor, your poor health, warning, we may ignite into spontaneous prayer. But if you tell us about the homeless and you tell us about those who are addicted and those who are dying in the streets, our own, from our own church, dying in the streets, warning, we might ignite into spontaneous service. If you tell us about your ideology that runs counter to the word of God and truth and is toxic and poisonous to others, warning. We may ignite into spontaneous speak and speak the word of God against you. If God is an all-consuming fire, it means we have access to that all-consuming fire. Be combustible. Be ready to go off at any minute. People should look at you like you got this crazy tick. What's going on? Well, Sean's about to go off. He's about to go off in the spirit. He's about to pray. He's about to speak God's word. What's going on here? So that we can ignite this place. This is what I'm going to, going to do the whole rest of the sermon. When is he going to go off? You don't know. In verse 4, Jesus tells them to stay and wait. For the promised gift and the coming of the Spirit. And in verse 8, he says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Do you believe that the Holy Spirit is inside of you? I don't have time to go to each person. Do you believe? Do you believe? Do you believe? I don't have time. Collectively, say yes. Do you believe that the Holy Spirit has power? Yes. Yes. That's amazing. Well, I've got more good news for you. Jesus says that we also have that power. Could you imagine? How in the world are we going to be good witnesses to the ends of the whole earth without power? You unplug a Nintendo and you watch a kid freak out. He's playing Fortnite. Hey, Halo, you unplug that machine. It's freaking. You need power. <laughs> and how do we do that? As wet, soggy pieces of wood. How? It's very difficult. Have you ever tried to light a piece of wet, soggy piece of wood? It doesn't light. Some days we may feel like a soggy, wet piece of wood. You may be feeling like that right now. Well, you're in the right place if you are. Maybe we can light you on fire. The best place to be to get ignited, to gather, 
here with other Christians. That's the best place to get ignited. The more they gather, the greater the combustion. Don't run from the fiery flames of God into places within your life where you may go cold. Walk toward the flames. Become ignited. In our opening video, you heard the names Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were tossed into a fiery furnace because they refused to worship a false god. That furnace was heated up seven times its normal temperature. It was so hot that it burned up those that threw them in. But they remained untouched because a fourth walked amongst them. You know who that was, right? That was Jesus. They were protected by the fiery love of God. You are protected by the fiery love of God. So let the world heat up its temperatures seven times over. Bring it on. We will burn with the Spirit's fire seven times seven times seven times seven times over. In 2 Corinthians 4, though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Did you catch that? Where does our power come from? It comes from a divine power. Sounds pretty strong to me. There's a power word again. We have the power of Christ on our side. We have the power of the Spirit on our side. And we have the power of the Father on our side. Three, into the Holy and one God. So when this loving holy fire comes upon us, the first thing to be strengthened, the most important thing, is our faith. Right? The Hebrews chapter 11 shows us exactly what that could look like. And I want you to see a combustible, raging, spiritual fire and what that can do in faith. The fire of our faith when burning hot can do the unthinkable. Let's go through it. Now faith is the insurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are invisible. By faith Abel offered, up to, offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. By faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. By faith Noah Warned by God concerning events he hadn't even seen. In reverent fear, constructed an ark. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go to a place to receive an inheritance. And when he went, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age. By faith, when Abraham was tested, he offered up Isaac, his only son. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the sons of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. By faith, Moses left Egypt. By faith, Moses kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood. By faith, Israel crossed the Red Sea as on dry land. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to Israel. And in verse 32, it says, And what more shall I say? For what time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight, Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release, so that they may rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with a sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, 
wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised. That is what a fire burning faithfulness to God can do. And the most remarkable thing, they achieved miraculous things within their faith and had not yet even received the promised Holy Spirit. Yet we say with our mouth that we have received the Holy Spirit. But do our purposeful actions back that up? If not, the only thing we can do is crank up the temperature with actionable purposes. The story of Polycarp is a great example. It's an example of a faith on fire that was cranked up to its highest temperature. He was a bishop of Smyrna, modern-day Turkey, and a disciple of the Apostle John. At 86 years old, he was causing so many problems to the Roman Empire as he was leading thousands to Christianity and creating fiery, spiritually-led Christians that they sent soldiers to kill him. It's the only thing they could do. It's recorded that while deep in prayer in his bed, where he would spend hours upon hours praying, he had a vision of his pillow on fire. And he knew, and is quoted in the letter, the martyrdom of Polycarp. I must die by fire. Three days later, a group of Roman soldiers show up to arrest him. When they get there and find an 86-year-old man, they are astonished that such a frail-looking old man could cause such a ruckus within the mighty empire of Rome. What do you think Polycarp did? Do you think he ran? Do you think he begged for mercy? He immediately prepared them a meal and he served them. And after they had eaten, before they took him away, Polycarp requested that he may be able to pray uninterrupted for an hour. The guards stood in silence for a full hour as Polycarp prayed. And he prayed in front of him. He was so filled with the grace of God, the letter says, that he prayed for two hours. The men were, again, astounded. And many of them regretted coming to arrest such a godly and venerable old man. As if all that wasn't fascinating enough. God cranks up the fire within Polycarp to a whole different level next. They led him, they led him away on a donkey. See some comparisons here? To a place they wished to kill him. In an arena. As a spectacle. Remember, Polycarp lived during the most horrific persecution the church has ever seen. This was a massive public event. There were roaring crowds excited for this. They were bloodthirsty for his death. Killing Christians was a sport. There were Christians also there who witnessed it. They compiled their witness to form this letter. And a voice from heaven rang out, which the audience hears, Be strong and show yourself a man, O Polycarp. Which means, gird up your loins, Polycarp. Which means, equip your spiritual armor, Polycarp. The proconsul goes out with a chariot and picks up Polycarp, takes him into the middle of the arena. And he sits him down in the chariot and he says, Denounce Christ and call Caesar your Lord. Polycarp refuses. And so he's kicked out of the chariot, which causes both of his legs to be dislocated. Before the command to burn him alive was even finished from the lips of the proconsul, people within the stadium were running around gathering wood for what was called the funeral pile. They were tearing off pieces of wood from the stores on the streets to record it. Anywhere they could get wood, they wanted to build a massive fire. They grabbed anything they could get their hands on. And when they came with their nails to secure him in place, so he wouldn't struggle to get away from the flames as he burned, Polycarp said to them, Keep your nails. You will not need them, for it's God who gives me strength to endure fire. And he will keep me from moving in this one. They allowed Polycarp to pray, and so he prayed. I'll read the rest of the eyewitness account. When he had pronounced this amen and so finished his prayer, those who were appointed for the purpose kindled the fire. And as the flame blazed forth in great fury, we to whom it was given to witness beheld a great miracle and have been preserved that we might report to others what then took place. 
from the fire, shaping itself into the form of an ark, like the ship of a sail, when filled with the wind, encompassed as by a circle the body of the martyr. And he appeared within, not like flesh which was burnt, but as bread that is baked, or of gold and silver glowing in a furnace. Moreover, we perceive such a sweet odor coming from the pile, as if frankincense or some such precious spices had been smoking there. The fire would not burn Polycarp. The flame circled him like the sail of a ship, was unable to touch him. It's a recorded miracle in history. This is what faith can do. Miracles. Miracles given through the power of God. If the world is out gathering sticks and wood for kindling, to come at us Christians with worldly fire, they can heat up their blazing furnace to the high heavens. We as Christians, we gather as spiritually combustible kindling. And together we will conquer anything and everything this world has got for us by and through the Holy Spirit and in our Lord Jesus Christ. The flames of the world cannot touch us when we have the fire of the Holy Spirit, but the fire of the Holy Spirit can ignite the world. That same power Polycarp had is within all those who believe. That same fire he had, it's right here. So we let that fire burn. We don't do controlled burns as Christians. We burn uncontrollably. We should be known as pyromaniacs. We really should. You look at the Oxford Dictionary for what py pyromaniac is, a person with an obsessive desire to set fire to things. Yep, that sounds about right. That is what I'm trying to do right now, right? Including myself. This is only possible because of Jesus and because he presented himself alive. So let's finish verse 3. We're going to be here until tomorrow. <laughs> he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Well, now we know what all this alive business is about. Our purpose is not just to present ourselves, our, not just to present ourselves even alive. Anyone could show up to something alive. We are presented alive with a purpose towards building the kingdom. And this kingdom belongs to the king. It's the amalgamation of two words, king and dominion, kingdom, which Jesus has both. King because he is our royal and holy majesty as Lord, dominion because as king, everything was made through him. John 1, all things were made through him and without him, not anything made that was made. And in him was life, and the life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Then back to our verses in verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes, and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. The disciples here are being told, He is coming back. Christ is going to return to this earth again. Do you believe that? Hopefully, with the craziness of this world, people start to remember that. From the time of his ascension, from the time of his return, the church has had one singular task. Spread the message of Christ as Lord and Savior. It's that simple. And so Jesus builds his kingdom through us. Look at how many cultures we now have in our churches, right? And in our island now. It's wonderful. Many of them are Christians moving here from other countries. It's a testament to the gospel which traveled into the world. It's so amazing. I hope they come and reignite a flame in PEI so that when the Lord and the Lion of Judah roars from Zion as Jesus returns on a white horse to reclaim his church, if Jesus placed one foot in the Pacific Ocean and his other foot in the Atlantic Ocean and looked down 
at North America with those fiery eyes that John says he had. And Jesus, will he see Prince Edward Island lit up with a massive fire from the Northumberland Strait to the Gulf of St. Lawrence? And then we could say, here we are, Jesus, we're over here. And as we burn, I hope that we'd be a pleasant aroma to Jesus. So if you've moved here recently, welcome to PEI. Now, help us light this place up. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. We have to embrace people moving here because it's not stopping anytime soon, and it shouldn't. I hope they can help break these strongholds all over the island because the body of Christ is one. It's not divided by race or color or culture. Not even weirdness is supposed to divide us. And if we're all honest, and it's church, we're supposed to be honest. I think we could all admit there's a little bit of weirdness in all of us, right? Embrace the weird. <laughs> Embrace it. Churches on PEI have two choices. Smarten up and start some fires. Or pack it up and go for a swim into the Atlantic. Find some scuba gear and dive to the bottom. And find some rocks down there. Because that's where we're all going to want to be if Christ returns to find his church divided and at war. Lord have mercy on the state of the churches on Prince Edward Island. Lord have mercy on us. The church is meant to shine in the darkness, not create the darkness. 1 Corinthians, for if in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews are Greeks, slaves are free, and all are made to drink of one spirit. We are a one. And as one, we are on a mission, church. A kingdom-building mission. Our mission hasn't changed in 2,000 years. And the way we carry it out hasn't changed in 2,000 years. We do it together. We do this as the church because Jesus is coming again to reclaim his church and restore all things, all of creation. Come on up, Dan. I'm starting to twitch. <laughs> you come on up, you twitch with me. There he goes. There he goes. He's about to go off. Yeah. Get some twitch music going. <laughs> John the Apostle was in the presence of the glorified Jesus as King. It was John who got to see those eyes like a flame of fire. Can you imagine? And he fell down as if dead. Who wouldn't? Of course Jesus' eyes would burn like a flame. Because Jesus burns with passionate love for his, for his church. He burns with passionate love for you within his church. Because Jesus loves people. Jesus does not want to see his church divided, his people all divided. Remember the example of Christ from his cross. Father, forgive them, for they, don't know, for they know not what they do. And Father, forgive us. Forgive us. We are called to love our enemies and serve our enemies, but we can't even properly love all our brothers and sisters. What a state we're in. This has to change. It has to. As it embers, it starts with one, which becomes few, which turns into several, and then becomes hundreds, which turns into thousands. Christianity started with one, Christ, and it spread to billions. Repairing interchurch relations relationships can start with one and spread. Israel is at war. We don't need the lamp of the world at war with itself too. We use fires to burn each other up when we should be using fires to build each other up. And Jesus doesn't desire lukewarm faith, which means he's not looking for small burning fires. Have you ever gone camping with someone who is an actual pyromaniac? You go to the main office and you buy two to three bags a firewood. You think that's going to last you a few nights, you're good to go. You go into the tent to grab some marshmallows because you want to make some yummy s'mores. And through the tent's wall, you see a light lit up as bright as the sun. 
The person has emptied all three bags onto the fire and then poured some gasoline on it. Well, that's what we want. In the spirit, don't go lighting fires. I don't want to hear that in the news that you went lighting a bunch of fires. We're lighting fires in the spirit. Spiritual flames that go high into the sky. So people all around say, what in the world is going on over there? We are a curious bunch. We humans are by nature curious. If you think cats are curious, people are on a whole nother level. We can't look away from flashing lights and sirens on the roads. Your eyes are drawn to them. That's amazing. You know you can. Our flesh is very, very curious and it can get us into trouble sometimes. But our spirits are also curious. Very curious about God. Longing for God. Waiting for God. And one day, we will get to celebrate with God in His kingdom. But until then, we have work to do. Being used as inter instruments by God to build His kingdom. When Christians move together like a like school of fish in the sea, as scripture says, of the same mind, when we move with one purpose, we position ourselves to make the greatest gains for the kingdom. If all things are for the glory of God, all of our works, all of our works within love should be for the glory of God and for the glory of God alone. If you picture the church like a giant rowboat, when the oars hit the water at the same time, it creates the greatest propulsion. Now, if the oars don't all hit the water at the same time, that's not going to sink the boat, right? So it's okay, it's okay to have differences of opinion. It's okay to have small differences in doctrine. It's okay to have differences in church philosophy. I consider that the oars all hitting the water slightly differently. Sure, it would be better if we all agreed unanimously, but that isn't going to sink the boat. But when we start to disagree to a level where some now are wanting to paddle backwards, maybe people are pushing the church towards dangerous doctrines. Maybe people are wanting to serve themselves rather than other people and start to paddle backwards. Some people don't want to row at all. And some pretend like they are rowing, but their paddles aren't even touching the water, which will exhaust all those trying to row. Now what's happening is the boat goes nowhere and it spins around in circles. We are to work in unison with one mind. The apostles as one went to the upper room. The upper room is where they waited for the promised gift of the Holy Spirit. We do not have to wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is here right now. The Holy Spirit is here. It's by divine inspiration that the book of Acts was written. And it's by divine situation that the book of your life is written. And what is that book going to say? The Acts of, place your name there. And remember I said the Acts. The actions focus primarily and completely on the heart. So you can cross out the word action and you can put the heart of your name. Show the world your heart by showing it its deeds that flow from the heart and you will show the world Jesus Christ. And Jesus in that way is glorified as sovereign Lord. As we bring honor to the Holy Spirit who is inside of us. As we bring honor to the Father who Jesus came to serve, who we now serve. The church needs to go back to, this, to the simplicity of its faith, a simple love for the king of all creation. The early Christians lived in that space, all together within one faith, glorifying Christ together. We are sometimes overlooked here in Prince Edward Island, but if we can light a flame big enough, people will come from miles and miles to watch us burn. The light shines in the darkness. Heavenly Father, blessed Lord, I pray now for the church on Prince, Prince Edward Island, all the churches in Prince Edward Island. If you hear this prayer, just pray with me together that the uh, churches on Prince Edward Island would come together to be one unified and magnified voice for Christ. All those that are here, I just pray that the embers, that you carry the ember inside of you of the Holy Spirit, that you realize the power that's inside of you right now and how strong it is. It's by divine power that you even got to sit here. It's by divine power you even get to breathe. So I pray that you carry that. 
throughout all of Prince Edward Island, throughout all the world, wherever you go, so that you can magnify the strength of Christ in this world. In your great name, I pray this all, Jesus. Amen.